To truck it, I'm Dooner here with Michael Vincent, the dude, and a special guest co-host. Introduce yourself, young man. I'm, my name is Bill Priestley. I produce Freight Waves now. You produce Freight Waves now. I do. <laughs> How did you get in here without a beard? Uh, it's a good question. I actually shaved this morning on accident. <laughs> I'll tell you how he got in here without a Bill's been doing great work on Freight Waves now. Appreciate uh, they that. They recently relaunched the program. They redid it, and they put some new segments that... Bill is championed on there, which is the roundtable and Freightways Mailbag. He's been doing awesome work there. He's going to mm-hmm. do a little bit of a roundtable with us here so you can see what's offered on Freightways now. And I uh, thought it'd be great to introduce you to our audience here, Bill. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, I've, I've been in media for, geez, 25 years. Yeah. And uh, just, I mean, this is, this is uh, you know, a dream gig to come be able to him and kind of headline, or not headline, but head up a show and, and produce it. And uh, so we're having a lot of fun. So when you were in media, you weren't in freight media, though, were you? No, it wasn't in freight media. Most, mostly, uh, mostly sports and some news there as well. Yeah, you were a sportscaster, right? Yep. Yep. And you still do that? Or? I do do that, yes. Yeah, okay. Like pickleball? What market were you in? Pickleball. Yeah, Major League Pickleball. Uh, I've been all over the place. I've been in uh, Indianapolis, or at least in Indianapolis, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, a little bit of Georgia. Yeah. you got a little affiliation with the Campbell uh, Humps, right? I do, yeah. I was there for eight years. All right. Sal yeah, Mercogliano. Awesome. Met Sal Mercogliano over there as right. well. Right. What, what was Andrew Luck's problem? <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I can't answer that one there. I'm, you know, I was I was actually there um, in, in Indy uh, before he got there. Oh, okay. so, was, so Manning. Pey- Manning was still there, yeah. Oh, okay, Manning. There you go. Who is the guy that was on there? That Was it Marvin Harrison that everyone thought was like – this silent great receiver, but it turned out he was running like this network of, of like thugged out car washes. Yeah, yeah, that that story did come to to light. That was that was an interesting. You know, I've caught everybody by by surprise. It really did. Yeah, everyone thought Marvin Harrison was like he was kind of like it, like art. If you remember Art Monk, he was like this. Oh yeah, just like he went out there, he did the work, and he started in trouble. It was like yeah, actually in the background, he's like Walter White. Yeah, why yeah. are you dancing no. around the issue that Drew Brees is investing in the uh, pickleball, pickleball league? league? That is pretty amazing. When you think I about think it. it's crazy, man. Pickleball's taken off. We need for to some stop strange it. reason. I'm against it i'm against yeah. it they well, must be okay. stopped pickleballers you know i'm indifferent to it but yeah well some people want this to be stopped it's the protests around yeah. ab5 we talked about it last week in socal it was only two days right um and then we heard it was going to happen in oakland but the one in oakland has kind of exploded a little bit it's been going on for the entire week long here's the clip from tuesday where tensions were getting really hot come on <laughs> come on come on come on get out from this block us out with this no, no. Blocking me, dude. You block, no, yes, you are. I said, you ain't blocking me, dude. No. What's up? 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 I mean, this scene, what do you guys make of it? This seems like sort of what's be to, to be expected on any video when you see a conflict. There's a bunch of people swearing at each other and, you know. And backing down from each other, which is good that they keep backing down from each other. Nobody wants could to escalate it, that's for sure. It's, it's always this the, is a Disney world. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it brings back bad memories we'll of 1992 yeah. strikes that I was in <laughs> and with the Teamsters. Yeah, no, it's uh Now, so, bad Vincent, situation. I had read that the union said they were standing with the AB5 protesters, but that was that in Los Angeles? That does not obviously seem to be the case here in Oakland. Yeah, I don't know. I, 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 that's straight because their official uh, uh, document that came out is that the, the ILWU was in uh, support of AB5, but then their workers were not crossing the picket or protesters. They were standing in unison with them. They've got, they've and got now a very interesting dynamic going on there because yeah. you've got, you've got obviously, if AB5 goes through, and it did, and, and you have uh, owner-operators becoming employees, that obviously increases the numbers of the union, and they, right. would, they would appreciate that. However, at the same time, these guys that are protesting AB5 are basically anti-management. Yeah. So that's so they they feel for them on both sides of that coin. Well, I think you could yeah. also be sort of pro-worker choice, right? Yeah. And support this. You could be in a union, 
but understand that in terms of laws, in terms of global scope, in terms of your own ability and flexibility to move between jobs, yes. you may support that worker choice. So just being part of a union doesn't necessarily mean you are right. against other workers who may not be in union standing up for their rights. Uh, right. See, I agree with you. I think that's a good point. The, the ILW, you guys, they knew what they were getting into when they took those jobs, right? They took those. These right. other guys chose not to, and now they're being forced into it. So I think you're right. I think it's support of that as well. Yeah, right. I don't. Maybe they're listening to what the protesters said, because this is a video from about 12 hours ago. It was, it was, this was, we got one from yesterday. Here, show this clip. It's a lot less uh, dramatic than the one that we just showed. You guys got it? Nope. You just <laughs> showed it? Oh, it? Not this one, the next one. Maybe they don't get it. Well, either way, take my word for it. Hopefully they can <laughs> find that one on the back. It's on the sheet in block two. Um, <laughs> no sound. When they do find that one, you'll see Indeed. that tensions have at least calmed down at the at the port a little bit. I am I am not sure if this can extend into next week. What do you guys? Oh, here it is. Like, here we go. Calm down a little bit. What do you think, Bill? Think we'll see us next week? Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, it depends on how convicted you are about the situation. I mean, we're talking about, you know, do you do you lock eyes and, and try and, and, and stare down the opponent? Uh, we'll see. I mean, we talked a little bit about this on Freight Waves Now where you have, this is obviously, if you can keep going, you know, in a free economy, there's yeah. going to be some pushback. And sure. at some point you got, okay, do we acquiesce in some degree to the protest? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. It just depends on how 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 hard feelings you have about the entire situation. Well, we got a lot going on on the show today. Let's yes, uh, get into it. Let's tip the band. And uh, we got, uh, let's see, we got Small Shipper says they were screwed by TQL. Yeah. Talk about this big flower shipment. This is a Imagine great one. That. I'm really excited to see or interested to hear what happened here. We're talking about chasing talent in the brokerage world. Uh, labor shortages hurting safety. Ketchup spoons, Disney brawls, trucker pet <laughs> adoption programs, and more. Sit tight. Tip yeah. the band right here. We got... Uh, did you know that AIT Worldwide Logistics is one of the fastest growing freight forwarders out there? It's true. They grew by 400% over the last five years, earning a spot on Crane Chicago Business Fast 50 list. How do they do it? By earning their customers' trust with cost-effective, customized global supply chain solutions. Find out how your business can benefit when you visit. Tell them, dude. Hey, go to AITWorldwide.com. I know my good friend Bill Priestley is going to do that. Sure. Absolutely. You know what right. else Bill's going to do? He's going to lead a little roundtable here. Bill, show us what really? you do with these roundtables. Really? Okay, we're going to do roundtable? It's table? a round right, table. So let's do a roundtable. All right, so we have uh, we got a couple of questions here, and I'll just throw them out. And, uh, you know, this guy over here gets a little confused sometimes as to who I'm going to first. It's because I'm sometimes. looking in here, and you're yeah. pointing the other way, and I, I, uh, I'm not that smart. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about AB5 here for a second. Uh, <laughs> let's say you're an AB5 protester in the Port of Oakland. Uh, how long would you continue the protest uh, and hold your position in Oakland, or um, how, what would what would it take to get you to leave? I'll go with you, sir. First. I could do it as long as my wife let me. <laughs> <laughs> when she said get back to work, I'd have to get back to work. Uh, you know, if, if I was one of those workers, I'd be protesting pretty hard because I'm anti the man, anyways. Mm -hmm. And I would go as long as I could possibly do it financially. I think that's the issue: is how long can you go? Because they're not being supported by any uh, strike stipends from a union. No. Right on. So uh, as long as I can support my family uh, and keep them safe and do this, I'd be fighting this fight. All right. Dinner? Uh, you know, it's a tough one because you're there at the Port of Oakland and it's like how it's almost a question we just had in that when we looked at that video. Do you go into next week? And, and what is the point? You know, who is who is listening now? They're getting media attention. They're getting people to to talk about it. And mm -hmm. maybe that. If you yourself are a protester, that gives you that positive feedback you need to see to stay out there. Yeah. But I don't know if this is a situation that's going to be won by protesting at the port. I think this is the first stage of just bringing awareness to it, bringing awareness to other drivers, bringing awareness to other gig workers. If Actually, I've noticed recently, um, because trucking's gotten so much attention to AB5, there's actually a lot of other independent gig workers who've been chiming in on like mm -hmm. posts that we've been putting up and other people have yeah. talking about all of the other freelancers in there. So I think one thing that truckers should really consider doing is joining up with these other groups if they feel this way. Strength in numbers, build that collective. I mean, you already saw what happened with Uber and Lyft spending $200 million to get out of this thing. Oh, 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 right. Yeah. I've got a follow-up comment. Go ahead. So, yeah. D Duner, did I not see uh, uh, also there was a senator, uh, like a state senator or whatever, that was grandstanding on this topic as well, saying this should be brought back and we should be looking at this and possibly repealing that? Because that's another avenue. I agree with you 100%. Drivers, as long as you got that positive feedback, mm -hmm. people are going to keep protesting, right? And so if they can join with other people and get that strength together and get a politician to also do that, now you've got something, right? 
Yeah. You definitely do that. What do you think on that, Bill? What do I think? I think it, it ultimately depends, kind of a hybrid of what both you guys said, in that if it gets stronger, then you stay longer. Yeah. If it starts to die off, I mean, it depends, on, again, on how convicted you are about it. Because generally speaking, again, like strikes are usually unorganized. They don't necessarily have a hierarchy of sorts. You know, I, I kind of make it akin to like a, a homeowner's association where the powers at the top, everybody else just kind of follows, follows along. Um, so it's going to depend on how things uh, play themselves out in terms of, of how active everybody gets. Yeah, and I mean, when you look at the numbers too, I mean, hun- a few hundred, a thousand, it, it, yeah. it seems like a big number. But when you look at Well, if like 450 this- is enough to power down a port, yes, that's a big number. How- yeah. However, when you look at like the ILWU, you're yeah. talking about like 110,000 members. Yeah, so yeah, 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 when yeah. they want to strike, that 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 is something that people Massive. have to uh, have to listen to, where I think, and especially being the Port of Oakland, people could be at least... A little bit dismissive, but it'll be interesting to see what goes on next week. And yeah. um, I hope they at least get heard on this because it, it does feel like drivers got a little bit railroaded, especially the ones who want to make this choice. I, I agree with you. All right, All right you want one more? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure. All right. So 300 pot plants found yes. in the back of a trailer during, get this, safe driver week inspection in Canada, uh, where it's illegal. Uh, question, what's your excuse for hauling it? Wow. Uh, um, yeah. At least I wasn't smoking it, dude. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's in, there was a story here in the United States with these Idaho truckers, right? And they were moving hemp across state lines. And they yes, got that's right. in big trouble with that. And mm-hmm. marijuana is one of those commodities that the fact of the matter is, in some provinces, it is legal, right? Mm-hmm. In some cities, it is legal. And this is one of those things that drivers have to be aware of, though. Uh, as long as you're transporting a commodity like that in a country like Canada or the United States where it isn't federally legal, you can always run into these types of troubles. I, so thought, my, it was, I thought it was nationally legal in Canada, though. Uh, I, I don't think it, it is. I don't think it is. Okay, okay. Well, maybe. Uh, then it's I don't think dead, it is. Maybe yeah. on a medical level. But maybe yeah. whatever he was carrying, yeah. he, uh, he yeah. didn't have. Yeah, yeah. those were legit plants, like, not necessarily refined to a Oh, I got you. I got yeah, you. My excuse is yeah. they put the wrong commodity on the, on the BL. So. Yeah, I thought they were tomato <laughs> okay. plants, officer. They look like tomato plants. Maybe the Buckeye tree. I have. I know nothing. You know nothing. nothing. I, I didn't I, break I, the I seal, not, dude. I do not speak French or English. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I got to Quebec, sir. Okay, well, we have Mike Preach. We're in Canada? <laughs> we have Mike Preach here. He's the CEO and president over at Fleetworthy Solutions, where, you know what? They go beyond compliant, Michael Vincent. They He's do? He's also a Wisconsin alumni. We were talking earlier about how excited we are for college football season to start, even though it's more than a month away. But uh, how's Wisconsin looking? This year? Yeah. I think they're going to be pretty strong this year. They're, they're a contender for the Big Ten for the, getting into that championship. What do you think, Mike? Oh. For the season to start, our, our headquarters is not far from Camp Randall. I'm even wearing my Badger red, so. Yeah. Do you do, the jump around in the, do you do the jump around in the office every, every afternoon? We try to. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, is that part of the summer where you you really just start longing for football to be back and then you like look and you're like man over a month but uh good good to see it what, what's been up with you guys over there well we continue to grow uh you know we're having a great year uh you know last time i was on i told you that we're passionate about helping our customers you know go beyond compliance so a lot a lot of work being done here at fleetworthy well, where is the intersection? And, and this kind of goes back to a conversation some other people may have heard when we were talking about technology and we were talking about people. Now let's talk about both of them. Where is the intersection between people and technology and freight? Yeah, so we talk about for, for a carrier to be successful, we think it's a three-legged stool. It's not enough just to leverage technology, but you have to have a vendor that also is committed to bringing subject matter experts and people to the, to the table to help them you know, push these compliance boulders. And then the third is, you know, the fact that there's a lot of data coming out of the cab. How do you take that data, put it in, into a destination that becomes a single version of the truth for the carrier to, to meet FMCSA and DOT regulations? So we have, we take this three-legged stool to our customers and try to help them not only technologically, but give them bench strength so that their overworked safety department have partners that can keep an eye on the regs, make sure that they're they're following the rules and keeping their drivers and their trucks on the road. I love that statement. The uh, a single version of the truth is is awesome because that's what part of the problem or most of the problem is right there. Now you mentioned the safety departments. How overworked are safety departments right now? They're they're crazily overworked. When you you know it's it's hard enough to to you know keep up with a, a, a ecosystem of drivers that is growing, um, but when the regulations are changing iteratively every month, 
then you throw COVID and work from home and disperse employees. It just makes it a really hard equation to solve. So Fleetworthy, since we've been in business, have, have taken this approach as we're not only going to deliver you technology, but we're going to give you these people that are involved and really focused on all the regulatory changes so that when they need help, they have a staff that can help support their safety department. Excellent stuff. Excellent stuff. So how important is a single uh, version of the truth to uh, getting and getting these things fixed? Yeah, I mean, when when the, the government knocks on the door because there's a perception that you've broken a rule or you, 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 you're you outside of regulations, you know, rather than having to go to all these different locations to figure out what the truth is, uh, using our platform, they really can get one snapshot and understand what the risk truly is. Uh, and then, like I said, with the, with our staff supporting them, um, we, we can turn that data into actionable data quickly uh, so that they can mitigate risk. And Mike, when you're looking ahead in this year, what do you think the biggest challenge will be? And we're coming off two very challenging years, but when you're thinking about the rest of the year for Fleetworthy, what do you think uh, your team will contend with or your customers will contend with? Yeah, I think our big the, the things that we're seeing, um, driver shortage and the ability to, to get an applicant in the cab as fast as possible is something that all of our, our, our carriers are struggling with. Again, that's where having a bench strength of people to help you compress that time to get that applicant, you know, into your cab instead of a competitor's um, cab is very important. Um, you know, gas prices obviously is is making carriers really want to understand the best routes to take when they're they're making deliveries and things. Uh, so our ability to help them with routing and things like that is another, you know, uh, situation that is on the front of mind of, of carriers we're talking to. Yeah, it absolutely is to gain those efficiencies and lower carbon emissions and get the capacity actually utilized and in, in the correct position. Well, you, you mentioned here that, you know, the intersection of technology and people, right? And I contend that if you've got that data, that it can be a, an issue when you, when you move forward and there, there, could be a, uh, there could be a safety issue that is there, right? And you talk about the importance of those people being trained in that subject matter, right? How important is that to defending or proving your safety record? Hugely important, right? I mean, you can imagine all the data that's coming out of the cabs. If you look at, you know, carriers that have a substantive number of drivers and assets and the amount of not only driver qualification information and and hours of service and fuel tax information, it's all coming out. If you don't have people analyzing it and making sure that, you know, you're within the regs, um, it it makes it hard to respond when, when something bad happens. So, our goal is to get all this data in one place, uh, layer on technology and our people expertise to make sure that at any given moment, they know they're good. Gotcha. Wow. wow. Excellent uh, stuff. Yeah, really important. I've got a stupid question. Okay, you. what is it? I already spun it before yeah. before we went. I mean, well, it's more of a, it's more of a, uh, a, uh, a, a trivia question about okay. Wisconsin <laughs> football. What year did they win their first game and what was the score? <laughs> now, if I would have known these questions were, were going <laughs> to, I, I it was, have no idea. It was eighteen ninety, and they won one hundred and six to zero over Whitewater Normal. Go Badgers! <laughs> <laughs> well, Mike, what do we have to look forward to coming out from Fleetworthy um, as we move forward? So, you know, we released our, our CP Suite platform at the beginning of the year um, this year. Uh, we're really working hard to make sure that the the dashboards and smart tiles and things that w- that we're creating for our our customers, you know, give them actionable data right at their fingertips. Um, so you're going to see a lot of functionality in our platform uh, over the next couple of quarters. Uh, so we want to make sure that you know we're helping our, our carriers and our customers be compliant. Um, and you know, you'll see us do a lot of interesting thing from from a mobile technology perspective. Uh, giving drivers, you know, the ability to really um, interact with our platform seamlessly, uh, making sure that, you know, they're compliant and they can spend their time, you know, doing their job rather than worrying about jumping through hoops to staying compliant. Very well spoken. Well said, Mike. Thank you. Love it. Thank you very much for coming on the show. We look forward to seeing what the Badgers do this year in college football. We just look forward to it being awesome. back in general. <laughs> Take care, <laughs> Always sir. Always enjoy being with you guys. Have a great Take it easy. 
Good stuff out of him. Seems yeah. like he's going to have a nice weekend. Now, Bill, tell me. So yeah. you're relatively new to freight, right? Relatively, yeah. Is there a story that has really sort of struck Ooh. you or really captivated you so far that you guys have covered over on now? Gosh, there have been so many. Yeah. Uh, well, certainly the, the way that the entire industry has reacted to the pandemic and then also obviously what came out of that with stimulus and then uh, LA Long Beach. I mean, just that entire uh, issue is something that's going to like – we talked about it on Freight Waves now. It's it's the rock that was stone that was thrown into the placid lake and now everything's rippling and rippling and coming back to the center and nobody really understands what's going on, which I think makes the industry number one, entertaining to cover, as you know. Yeah. Uh and and two, uh, it brings up a whole lot of different storylines, especially of course, as we're talking about moving into these new areas of coverage, uh, where you're talking about innovation, where you're talking about autonomy, where you're yeah. talking about technology and how much of that is going to come in. You're also talking about a, um, a, a workforce that is aging, uh, that needs to be replaced. And, yeah. you know, you have baby boomers that are retiring at 10,000 a day. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. and yeah. that's something that you're we're right. going to talk about on Freight Waves now on Monday, but, um, that's, that's an issue. I mean, this, this is no, as many people have said, there is no new normal and I don't think there's going to be a normal for a long time. Right. And, and it's the, is it, 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 how, how impressed were you to find out just how important the issues are? There's almost nothing superfluous right. about the logistics industry and what's going on to it. Even small strikes that are out there can affect thousands if not millions of people out there and and the future right yeah. and the safety and security of our country really relies on a sufficient supply chain when yeah. you when you and think not about, only that right? but on a world scale there as well when you're talking about Russia Ukraine sure uh, and what what's going on in that re respect to uh, to Ukrainian grain that usually goes to Africa and the Middle East to help feed those populations now that's not happening right uh, and and who that will cause worldwide ripples uh, in the economy as well. So, yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. One little thing, you know, can trip the dam uh, and and cause a massive flow yeah. in one direction. Yeah, that butterfly wing. Oh, yeah. Right? That, yeah. that, that effect. Of and even not even just here, like you said, right? Because right now we've got the ILW going on. We've got the railroad issue that's going on. We've got AB5 that's going on. Mm -hmm. And all this crap that's going on, quite frankly. And now but we've also got California. port issues over in, in, in Germany, right? Yes. You've got possibility of strikes there, which is not going to be a small impact on us because it's no. a major trans movement of cargo coming from the e from from uh, from Asia, Southeast Asia. Yeah. So you're also talking about, well, I mean, to, to your point about Germany, you're talking about also uh, LNG. Uh, coming yeah, LNG, because, yes. Uh, Russia is a, is, a, is a world provider of that, and that usually comes through that northern area. Yep. Uh, and, yeah, it's, you know, supply chain issues in you know, when we talked about when you talk about the semiconductor shortage, sure, uh, that is an issue that primarily affects Southeast Asia, and that in terms of getting those chips over here. Now you're looking at companies trying to nearshore and going to Mexico and going to uh, southern um, um, southern Arizona uh, yeah. to to build stuff over there. So yeah, you can see how just a little a little change in you know maybe just you know a, a fire at a semiconductor plant can throw everything off. Or baby formula. Yeah, it's the, or butter, baby formula. the butterfly that flaps its wings yes. in Africa, yeah. causing the, the rainstorm. And, you know, even yeah. someone like me or, or even you, we, we, I think one of the things that took me is, you know, Daniel Stanton, Mr. Supply Chain, would talk about mm -hmm. the bullwhip effect constantly. And yes. he warned us about the bullwhip effect all the way back in 2020, Michael Vincent. Mm -hmm. But, like, seeing it in action and just seeing how small shifts in buying here across one commodity or massive shifts – can cause gigantic ripples throughout the entire supply chain, throughout ocean shipping, throughout uh, air shipping, throughout land shipping. And it's uh, it's been crazy to see. And it's funny because for so long, supply chains have kind of been behind the scenes and they've been so uh, binaural. And it's interesting now that you think we won't be back to normal. They'll always be, they'll always be at the forefront. My grandfather uh, went to college on the GI Bill and uh, was uh, – <laughs> an interesting story about him is that uh, he took one of those you know, personality tests, say what you, sh what you should be doing in life. Yeah. And his, his dad had sent him to college to become an engineer. And after the, end of, after the end of taking this test, he had his 125 possibilities that he could do. Engineer was number 125. He should not have done it. <laughs> I um, love it. <laughs> but in doing that, he took a class on marketing and distribution and wrote a paper on distribution and realized much later in life with the advent of Walmart that Walmart had just absolutely catastrophically killed distribution in terms of how things are brought to the public. Oh, really? Uh, wow. And so, okay. well, I mean, when you have, it's, it's the general store magnified 200 sure times. Sure it is, sure it is, yeah. So. Buy a suit in a bag of yeah, peanuts. Yeah, and so, yeah, so, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, so with that, yeah, you realize you know, what kind of an effect you have in terms of those things where it's, like you said, you know, we try to figure this out and, and becoming more and more proficient in what's going on is paramount now because now at least you have a real lifetime example of what happens when a small change somewhere else can affect everybody else around the world. And yeah. if you, and, and to, to uh, Daniel Stanton's point about there being a ripple effect and the bullwhip effect, yes, absolutely. We're seeing it in real time every day. I'll show it to you in real time right now. Play this meanwhile. Oh. Now let's say that that car, well, the rope, I guess, is the supply chain that's connecting that, okay. that car that's in the ditch and what is to that? the truck that you're looking at here. Is that now, the American the consumer up there? the truck is the consumer, yeah, and the car oh, is Jesus. inventory. <laughs> and he's got to pull it out of this ditch. And this little and thing. Look, it's, and he did it, of course. Trucking saved Hold the on. day again. It looks fantastic. Oh, no. Oh. That bull whip, that kinetic energy he put. <laughs> is that the warehouse on the right-hand side that the inventory just hit? <laughs> shipping container or something. Is that a goat? <laughs> I don't know what happened there. Yeah. Is it usually worth it to call the tow truck? Oh man, yeah, you're right. You know, when you when you pull too hard, that's that that can be that can uh, happen. catastrophic. Yeah, that can happen. <laughs> Have you, ever, awesome. you ever been in one of those situations? What's that? Pulling a car with a yeah. rope? Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I yanked the uh, the the bent the frame out of the bottom of a friend's wow. car in college doing that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It, we didn't it know never seems to work out. Anytime no, we show a clip, never on, has. Never it's seems always better. <laughs> it's <laughs> always better. Also, I had a buddy who got caught, uh, got stuck parking with his girlfriend in high school, and we had to call a tow truck. <laughs> oh, <no>. <laughs> <laughs> they tried. <laughs> oh wow. Hey, let's go over to David Stone. Everyone's a Lobo senior director, transportation manager, wolf, wolf, writer, wolf. system. By the way, one of my guys, so Rider System, it's such like a Berenstain Bears kind of thing because everyone thinks it's Rider Systems. And then you tell us Rider Systems, like, no, it's always been Rider Systems. And so you like show them a graphic. Yeah, and it's never been Rider yeah. Systems. Isn't that true, David? That, that is a spot on, boys. How are we doing today? Happy Friday, guys. Man, Happy we are Friday, doing brother. good. We've, doing been well. taught, we've got college football in the mind today, man. Yeah, we, we can't do. wait for the season to it's start. Be. How, how do you keep yourself entertained in these sort of like dead zone of the summer? Oh man, I mean, uh, it's uh, it's waiting for the season to start and figuring out all the uh, draft picks that I need for my fantasy team. Man, I'm doing tons of research and data. I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't be a true broker if I wasn't doing my research, right? So that's what I do all summer. <laughs> you got to be excited harness, about those Lobos, though. Ranked 125, they got a real shot at it this if year. We can harness the amount of energy put into fantasy sports. I mean, you know, we could we could turn this thing around. David. Oh yeah, hell yeah, we could. Well, that's, you just absolutely. by the way, absolutely, and. It, Fantasy supply chain. What's the budget? A fantasy supply chain. Oh, oh, supply chain. Fantasy supply chain. <laughs> we tried that. No one played it. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> we, we already tried Bad that idea. one, Forget David. It. <laughs> I take it back. Sell. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you guys are cl- right. You're not even far from us anymore. You just opened a brokerage up in Nashville. Tell us. Let's start there. Why the Music City? Oh, we couldn't be more excited to be in Nashville, guys. I mean, this is going to be a, a fun ride for us, but... I mean, truthfully, really, it, it, it's all about our growth strategy. And our growth strategy is go where the talent is. I think I got asked uh, the other day, you know, what are you doing in this market? The recession's coming. How are you guys playing this? And for me, it's the same way that we deal with customers, right? Keep that pipeline full. Um, keep bringing folks in. Build that culture up. Um, and for us, Nashville is a destination city, right? You have a ton of folks that want to go there. You also have a ton of folks that are already there from a transportation perspective. So for us, it's a no-brainer. Uh, we dropped a location uh, in Nashville. Couldn't be more pleased with the startup of it. Um, and uh, and we're building that place out to, to be a behemoth in the freight brokerage world for us. All right. And let's not let's not lie, David. They got hot chicken there, too. It's good. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's it. <laughs> Yeah, so culture culture is incredibly uh, important in in brokerage and in any company, really. And so is the advancement in technology. And a lot of people have used technology and kind of lost that connection with people with the great work from home. Yeah. How are you guys using technology to build up that culture and really enhance the training and retain those employees? Yeah, I think for us, um, you know, culture is such a fun buzzword. Uh, but for us, really, all that culture starts at the onboarding process. And so when we bring folks in, um, we spend the time um, to build out the right expectations, uh, the right mindset. Um, and we focus a lot on understanding what technology is there, what technology helps them, what technology um, can allow them to be more efficient. Um, and then we partner with certain technology providers that allow us to, to really have fun. I know we were talking about fantasy football at the start of this, but we've partnered with um, other companies that allow us to actually run fantasy football type of events with our onboarding or with our account executives that are in full time. 
Um, but everything related to our technology and uh, and what we're doing inside of that is to make sure that uh, that our account executives know that it is for their benefit and to make them more efficient uh, and to allow them to see where they're at, where they're going, um, and uh, and kind of build from that perspective. Um, we run ramp plans through our technology to allow them to see where they're at and how they're trending to other folks. We allow them to have contests with other folks um, so they can battle each other in that piece. And it just creates this environment that allows them to have fun while they're learning this business and while they're getting better at the, at their craft. I love it. I love it. So what's your remote, what's your view on the remote from work, uh, uh, work from home uh, and a return to the office, bring them back or leave them at home. Yeah, I think that's a, uh, that's a touchy subject for a lot of folks. And I think that, you know, what we are doing doesn't necessarily match up with, uh, with what's best for everyone. Uh, but we're big proponents of back in the office. Uh, we've had folks back in the Fort Worth office and the Novi office uh, for a while, and we've seen the success with it. Um, we see more collaboration. We see more coaching, more mentoring. Um, and I think it's a lot of fun when you watch a new person listen to somebody that's been crushing it for a while, um, and they can really dive in and understand why they're crushing it. Hey, they're on the phones, and these are the things they're saying, and this is how they're interacting with the carrier, with the customer. Um, and you see those new folks kind of pick it up a lot faster. Um, and I think the secondary piece to that too, you know, especially as we're talking about technology, um, in this business, when uh, when things go wrong and there's certain components where you know, maybe the technology isn't matching up with uh, with reality. Um, folks can get up from their desk and walk over and talk to somebody about that and talk about what they're seeing and uh, and how to interact with that technology and how to fix it. Um, those are wins for us. And so, you know, as we open up this Nashville office, it's 100% in office. We believe in it. Uh, we've seen the successes from it. Um, and we'll continue down that path um, because, we, you know, that collaboration, that onboarding perspective that we get with folks being in the office uh, is something that uh, that we don't think can be replaced by being remote. David, let me ask you a question that's a bit more of an inside baseball thing, so you don't have to answer it completely if you don't want to. But uh, you started out saying culture starts with the onboarding process. Um, take me through the process of like how the evolution of attracting a new hire is for you. Are you changing your criteria? Have you changed your criteria in terms of what you're looking for in terms of who is going to be filling this Nashville office? Yeah, I think it's a good question. I think when you look around at characteristics of good freight brokers, um, there's a couple that constantly come up. Um, ownership is a big one. I mean, this is logistics and things go wrong and your ability to own an issue uh, is going to allow you to uh, satisfy that customer's needs um, and customers are going to pick up on that. So we look for a lot of that type of characteristic. Uh, we look for folks that, uh, that pay attention to details. Uh, but at the end of the day, I mean, we look for folks that want to hustle, that are in it to win it, um, and are looking for new ways um, to really, um, you know, build out their uh, their ability to talk with folks and build that trust. Um, that's really what we're selling at the end of the day is that trust. So those are the things we look for. I think from the standpoint of types of folks that are out there, obviously, uh, we go very heavily into entry level type of positions, and we we recruit very heavily in that, looking for kind of those same characteristics. Uh, but we also look for folks that have been in other industries and other uh, environments um, that uh, that have some of those same characteristics. Um, and we've been very successful in, in being able to 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 kind of scoop some of those folks away from other industries. So it doesn't necessarily just have to be transportation logistics professionals. We're looking for folks that really meet certain characteristics that we think are important. And once we find them, regardless of where they're at and what they're doing, um, then uh, then those are folks that we want to bring into the brokerage. David, yeah, very well said. Thank you for coming on the show today. We we appreciate uh, all you said here. It's very cool that you're in the neighborhood, a little less than two hours yeah. away. Everyone's a Lobo. Go check out Rider System, and you have a great weekend. You too, guys. We'll talk soon. We will. Take care. All right. All right, let's tip the band again. We got, uh, do you remember what Vaughn Moore from AIT said last time he was on the show? Yes. He said, bigger isn't better, better is better. He's right. Whether it's new offices in India, expanded life science operations in Europe, or acquiring one of the best final mile providers in the U.S., AIT's exponential growth is driven by anticipating and responding to customers' needs. Discover how they can help your business gain fast, streamlined access 
to new markets at, tell them, dude. Hey, go to AITWorldwide.com. Bill, I don't know why you're not listening to me. Go to AITWorldwide.com. History lesson, Michael Vincent. For over 35 years, Fleetworthy Solutions has provided a single source of solutions to help monitor and manage DOT compliance while mitigating risk for private and for hire carriers. With advanced technologies and exceptional client services, Fleetworthy becomes an extension of your team to help your company go beyond Beyond. compliance. Excellent stuff. I didn't get the cue there on that. So I'm sorry. The beyond compliant one. Yeah. <laughs> you have to just be a you have to be a frequent listener to know right. that one. Yeah. All right. So now we have the founder <laughs> of Plants Without Borders on Mark Javier. He reached out to me recently and he told me this story about how they're a small shipper. They have this big shipment of uh, of perishable goods. Their goods TQL Mega Broker made a big mistake on it that seems like it was their fault and there's been some drama since so we're gonna find out what can happen to small shippers here mark tell uh, thanks for coming on the show hey how's it going thanks for having me yeah we're happy to before we get into all of this what is plants without borders give us a little background on what you all do over at that company so we are a global online wholesale marketplace for plants so we connect buyers and sellers of plants all over the world. Right now, we're focused on bringing plants in from Southeast Asia and Latin America and letting greenhouse growers and uh, independent garden centers have access to that inventory. Very good. And so you, you, you do, you do some imports and you had, you had, you ran afoul of TQL according to this message you sent me. Give us a little background there. What, what happened and what was this incident all about? So, yeah, we basically connect small farmers to businesses in the U.S. Uh, this buyer was a retailer in Rhode Island. The supplier was a small farmer in rural Indonesia. And we had hired TQL as the freight broker to bring the shipment into the country. They had uh, incorrectly filed the online system, uh, the document summary, basically, and they didn't provide our import permit. So the shipment was lost, and it was around $13,000, which to TQL is, you know, a drop in the bucket. But to a small farmer in Indonesia, yeah, uh, that's a huge impact. And, yeah, it was really tough because the, the retailer lost their shipment, too. Uh, we tried to go back to them and ask them to submit a claim, but they just flat out refused and told us to talk to their lawyer. What, what was their excuse, Mark, for, for just saying, hey, forget it. We're not going to ignore your claim. Their excuse was that I signed a waiver uh, regarding the liability. But in the waiver, it says if it's because of negligence on the part of TQL, uh, then we should be able to pursue a claim. Uh, I haven't been able to get a, a valid response or just a response to that out of them, but that's where we left it. Wow. No, it mm-hmm. looks like they sent you a letter here. One of the things you forwarded me, it looks like they sent you a letter basically threatening you and saying, go pound sand. And if, you know, <laughs> the only thing we'll do for you is uh, give you 365.92 that apparently they say you owed them. Um, it, it, what, what happened there? How has this escalation gone for you? Have you been talking to a brick wall? It's like talking to a brick wall. Um, that $300 that they they so graciously waived me was, I think it was for customs or duties or something like that. But, you know, from our perspective, we shouldn't have to pay anything for this, right? Our, the buyer, they paid for the freight, like, you know, $3,500 and they were expecting the shipment and, you know, nobody got anything. And Mm -hmm. the fact that it's so clearly a mistake on their part and their refusal to even entertain refunding us is, is quite shocking. And before starting this company, I never had experience booking international freight or, or freight for that matter. But, you know, if this is what small businesses have to deal with to get their goods, you know, no wonder we're dealing with so much inflation. Yeah, it, it, that's, it's mm-hmm. crazy. No insurance, I guess, on the shipment there. And why wouldn't they just go to invoice value, Dooner? That's what we always did, right? We For paid out on invoice flowers? value, yeah. right? You're not going to go on the retail price of it, but you do at least the invoice value on something like this. <clears throat> and how difficult is it for you to just go down to the courthouse and say, hey, man, these guys owe me money. Is this outside of small claims type of stuff, Thirteen grand. 
think so. Uh, it's it's doable in small claims, but you know, uh, we're a pretty small shop, and yeah, we have yeah. to yeah. you know choose our battles. And you know, we could do this, yeah. sure, and some time, but you know, it, it's a process. Yeah. So we're still kind of figuring out what exactly we should do for recourse, but you know, for now, we've you know everyone's just taking it as a loss. I'm a little interested. I'm I'm interested in in this, and I'm not making fun of this at all, but in your letter to them, you talk about your local congresswoman is Nancy Pelosi. (laughs) Have you, but I I mean, did you follow through with that threat? Have you, have you reached out? Because I I would think somebody might be interested in something like this, especially if they're supporting the small business guys. This is the big guy crushing the little guy for real. Well, yeah. And in regards to that, and the reason I mentioned her is because you know, she's apparently in charge of investigating these international ocean freight companies that have apparently jacked up their prices. When I'm saying, you know, as a foreign company, they're expected to do that. But TQO is a U.S. company, and it's doing this to other U.S. companies. And I think that's a more important problem to address. Uh, but we haven't reached out to them yet. Uh, we still want to be strategic about it, but yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's got the government's attention. Like that's undeniable. I think it's a legitimate thing that could gain steam, mm-hmm. right? I mean, if you're, you catch you're somebody on the right day, absolutely. Yeah, it it absolutely it absolutely could. You actually did you start the GoFundMe and try and fight this type of stuff? Are you starting? Are you are you like being an advocate or are you are you taking action and activist? against this type of stuff not maybe not your 13 grand in particular but everybody uh, uh, you know industry-wide so i have a meeting later with a law firm that i'm working with on a pro bono basis and you know i'm going to speak to them first and see what would be the most advisable next step obviously tql is a huge company we want to make sure that we're doing things the right way Uh, but from our perspective you know all the facts are they're clear as to what happened here yeah And, you know, this can't be an isolated incident. And I think the larger issue is, uh, the larger issue is, I guess, the the way that freight is brokered. Yeah. Uh, In Mm -hmm. the Netherlands, for example, they have freight cooperatives. That's the first time I've ever heard of this. But I think there's a better way to match up uh, supply and demand when it comes to to shipping because the nature of a broker is to take as much out of the transaction as possible. We see this in in the plant world too. There's plant (laughs) brokers and we're not necessarily a broker. We're more of a farmer's market where everything's available, easily accessible, transparent uh, versus a broker situation. Like you're not really sure what their motivations are. Uh, The only thing you can be sure of is that they're trying to get as much money out out of the transaction as possible. He brings up some some good points and how predatory really this can be to smaller mm-hmm. shippers where um, a loss of $13,000 can put them out of business. Hiring yeah. lawyers can put them out of business. Yeah. Stopping operations to deal with the TQLs of the world can put them out of business. But there's so many shippers that do not have the leverage volume. Uh, they hear T- you Google, you know, a brokerage. TQL comes up pretty near the top. One of the biggest brokerages in the United States. Seven hundred and Got to be respectable. Got to so, be respectable. A shipper who hasn't actually got burned yet, they wouldn't know. They'd walk right into that that danger zone. What, Bill? You're hearing all this, and you're yeah. not you're not a re- native from the freight world. Is any of this surprising you? Technically, no. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah right. Uh, Fortunately, just, just because of that. And 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 Mark, let me just ask this question of you: Is you know, obviously, this is this has happened, and and you probably didn't have any preconceived notions that Tiki Well was going to to put you in this position. But moving forward, uh, ha, what kind of dil- d- due diligence, perhaps, have you done in in things going forward to try right. and avoid this situation? Right. So one thing that we've done is we've made it clear that the logistics and delivery is the full responsibility of the seller of the shipper. <laughs> okay. Good move. So that way we're, we're saying, hey, um, we're just a facility for you to get more orders. You're still going to be responsible for delivering it to the customer as if you know, it was any other transaction. Uh, that's fair, um, but it also restricts the, the sellers to, to those that are capable of shipping. So that's one adjustment that we've made to the platform. And uh, right now we're, we're looking actively for a freight company that can 
uh, also ship plants from South America, Southeast Asia to the U.S., but also from Southeast Asia to all the countries in Latin America. And we know that UPS and uh, FedEx, they do this already. Uh, but, you know, we're trying to look at all the different options out there because we want to be able to ship both small parcel and like, freight level shipments with a high degree of accuracy. Yeah, well, I mean, you have a very delicate commodity. You're talking mm-hmm. about plants here, and obviously people expect those to come in a uh, in a certain condition. Um, I got to ask you, so are, do you sell on the uh, consumer level at all? If our, our listeners uh, were interested in getting some plants for you, or if they were interested in offering you service, they say, you know what? I move plants out of South America. Mark should talk to me. What would How would we get them in touch with you? So you can go to our website. It's plantswithoutborders.org. My email is mark at plantswithoutborders.org. My phone number is 714-725-2934. And right now it's open to consumers. We're open to the general public. But we do want to really serve the business-to-business segment because there's a lot of potential there. It's more of a sustainable business. It's more predictable. And our needs are very clear. Like we just need a company that can ship plants, both in small parcel and freight. And, you know, price is obviously important, but as long as it's competitive, uh, the most important thing is that there's a commitment to to success, really, of the transaction. And if there's an issue, like, you'll at least be able to help us address it. There you go. Hey, man, if you're in this business, look my man up. Mark, well, Mark, yeah. I had another question for you. This is more of a curiosity one in terms of the supply chain of shipping or the logistics of shipping flowers. What uh, what ones do you do you love for for that method? What's what ships well, or what kind of flower do you just do you love selling, or what kind of plant do you just love selling? Well, I love selling the plants that do well in shipping. Uh, so the ones that uh, basically are are hardier, uh, they're not as sensitive. Uh, the anthuriums do really well. If you look on our website, uh, you can see a bunch of pictures of them, but. And really seeing the customer's reaction when it's really fresh and it's like new, like that's like that's gold yeah. right there. Like that gives us a lot of value because you know I can say with a high degree of certainty that like, yeah. the farmers I, in Thailand are not going to connect to the growers in Yukaipa. Are, are there like? Platform. Are there like plant puppy mills out there? Are there like uh, plant places oh, where you should just not or buy to or scammers yeah. out there? Like I bought a crepe myrtle tree, but it's a crepe myrtle. Yeah, but it's spelled with a K type of thing. Oh, like knockoff plants? Yeah, knockoff yeah. plants or scammers. Well, yes. Uh, the reason I started the company was because one year ago, there was this huge asset bubble in plants and people started buying plants from farmers in Indonesia on Facebook. So all the things that we're dealing with uh, – Basically, everyone was running into one year ago. And when I saw that, I said, hey, I can create an alternative regulated trading venue because these are, you know, these are regulated commodities that are perishable and there needs to be professionals handling this. So I created this company to to create that venue. Well, Mark, we, we like to hear it. Hey, listeners out, if, out there, if... Uh... You can help Mark in any way. You need some plants or you can handle his logistics, right? And you put him in a better right. place than TQL got him. Right uh, by all means, please reach out. Mark, thank you for your time today. Sorry this incident happened to you, and I hope you have better luck moving forward. Oh, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Take care, guys. Have a great rest of your day. You too. Take care. Now, Vincent, he brings up a good point there, and, and Bill, and it's it's that position that the small shipper is put in. And a lot yeah. of there, they kind of enter this blind. and. It can be very predatory. And I'm not saying TQL is always predatory, though in this situation, it does seem like they were. And he may find support in others who've been through a similar suggestion, a similar position as you, as you recommended, Bill. Yeah, it's, it's you know, like we, I think we've already pretty much nailed down this, that the, the big guy often hammers the little guy. And this is, you know, it's <laughs> unfortunate that, that, it, that it happens. And, and again, you're seeing it 
in a lot of facets of life that we're seeing right now, AB5 being one of them. Sure. The guys getting killed uh, sure. in terms of that. But, um, yeah, it's, 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 crazy. it's something where, where the little guy has got to tread lightly and, and make sure that they're doing the right things and crossing all their T's right. and dotting right. their I's. We've been too serious today. It's time for good news, bad news. Yeah. Yeah. Bad news and good news. Oh, yeah. Wait, watch out. There, there it is. Oh. I hope they're okay. Stop shooting, <laughs> crack. All right, good news. I don't know if you two are gamers, but I am. I have a I have a PS5, and I actually have the new PS Plus Network, so I was really excited for this new game that was coming out called Stray. Stray promises to let you be a cat. Most video games, like, if they have a cat, awesome. it's just, like, your avatar's a cat, but you're still holding, like, swords and shields, and you're behaving like a, a human. You're an anthropomorphic yeah, cat. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. is an actual real cat, and you even have a dedicated meow button. There's one problem, though, guys. It might be too realistic. Let's look what this game is doing to people's pets. Like, the dog doesn't like it at all. See, this guy's taking his television viewing in his in his, in his hands right here. This dog could take out that TV in a heartbeat. It's interesting. Yeah. My dog pays zero attention to TV. Neither does my cat. <laughs> but these ones, this one loves it. Look at this cat. This cat gets a little disturbed by this. Oh, yeah, because he turns on and goes, fell really? off a cliff. It's like, really? You watch the news? <laughs> well, my kid and I were kind of bummed because the game opens up so serene. You're hanging out with your four cat buddies. And yeah. then, like, very soon into it, you fall down that pit. Oh, and exactly. you're in there start, you just like you lose your litter. You lose your litter, <laughs> and you fall down here, and you, then you get a, uh, a robot bat, like a backpack with a drone. Because the cat, like the cat, is a cat. It can't talk or anything. It it works like a cat. There's even um, things on tables, and you press triangle, and it knocks them off the table. Have you gotten a hairball yet in this game? I have not gotten a hairball, but you, oh, you can even scratch <laughs> wow. carpets. And actually, sometimes that mechanic will actually like if you scratch at a door, someone like a robot will open the door, and you can sneak in through his legs. Oh, nice. Wow. Sweet. Well, hey, speaking of pets, did you know that right here in Tennessee, Memphis Animal Shelter is overflowing with pets? And this is across the country, right? They're yeah, taking really in is. more pets per day. The pandemic pet return? Going, mm -hmm. The pandemic pet return is happening now. They're taking in like 20 to 40 a day wow. at this place in Memphis. And so what they're doing now is they're, they've created a, uh, a service to pairing truck drivers with pets, and okay. truck drivers can actually get 50% off their adoption costs, wow. and they actually get a, like a free bed as well, right? Yeah. And this used to be like an issue for truckers. You come in and adopt it, and it, you, would, you would get excluded because they didn't want to give a, cat, a pet to a, a to, but they're taking it a different way. Angle is, you know, hey, maybe it's not the smartest thing when you first think about it, put a pet in a cab, but yeah. it's with their human all the time. Well, Which is where they want to be. Well, this is the, mm -hmm. it's at Memphis Animal Services, yes. right? Yeah. Yes. So they, someone at the shelter there, they actually had a great quote. It was Katie Pemberton. She yes. said, uh, "It seems like the life in a truck. Well, probably not for every dog. For a lot of dogs, there would be nothing better than to be there with your person always." Right so she's on. talking about there's a lot of dogs out there, especially dogs that are given away. They're given away because they have anxiety, they have separation anxiety yes. from their owners. You can't leave them home alone, go to work nine to five. Well, yep. you're staying here, bring them in the truck. You're not gonna be away from the dog. That that type of dog is perfect. What do you think, Bill? You like the you like the program? I like the idea as long as the dog is okay, obviously with being confined yeah. for yeah. for that amount of time. But also, maybe even just the shell shocked idea of every time you get out, you are not where you were. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I've taken my dog on road trips. So oh, I don't sure, yeah. As long as the family's there and, and you're, oh yeah, yeah. It's, okay, this is a new place. This is always a new place, and who knows what? Maybe that can be enlightening. But yeah, no, I like the idea. They are getting twenty to forty animals dropped off a day a too. A day, so dude. At one, place. I remember. I remember it's here crazy. in uh, Chattanooga, the local animal shelter was having the similar kind of situation. Yes, There's a yes. lot of animals are being dropped off and or returned. Um, because it didn't work out for a reason. One yeah, reason if you're another. a carrier, let the drivers have a dog or yeah. a, you know, a pet with them, and, and yeah. man, make this happen. Well, this is cool. Bad news, you can't seem to consume enough ketchup while eating fries. Well, here's the good news. Look at this thing. Heinz is, Heinz is releasing uh, ketchup fries. Says uh, they invented Heinz so people could love some fries. Yeah. This is and now they have made spoon fries. A scary, fry. What's the scary fact? A fry that's shaped like a spoon. He's and they did a survey. They said eighty-four percent of fries are under condimented. So they went out and they decided to uh, look. Geez, look at this. They're sick of their fries. Un under condimented. Under condimented. They say it's under condimented. Under condimented. Okay. So they came up with a solution, and it is this spoon. What do you guys think of the spoon? I love it. This is the first time I've seen it. So, I'm... so it's a French the spoon carved into the shape of brilliant. a spoon. And um, and fried, but I gotta tell you something. I think that the brilliance here is actually by Heinz in putting a lot more air in that box and giving you a lot less potato. 
But Michael Vincent, you you were telling me earlier that doesn't that doesn't bother you. Doesn't bother me at all. I absolutely love it. I will be a customer and I will use this to eat my mashed potatoes and gravy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I like the novelty of the idea. I might do it, you know, once or twice. I'm actually a fan of of ke- ketchupless fries. Uh, yeah, I, oh. I, I I I like I like my potatoes. What if I like the spoons th- tasted good without fries. Would you, would you eat them? Yes. Ironically, yeah. yes, yeah. It's, th- it's, th- it's, th- it's th- all down with to the malt vinegar. They sell these at Disney. What it's do we all got down going to taste. Th- th- thick cut with malt vinegar, and they sell that at Walt Disney as well. So here you are. The good news is, Dooner, you and and Bill, you guys are at the happiest place on earth. I don't want to screw this up because this is great. You're at the happiest place on earth, and you and your family just got in line to Mickey's Phil Har Magic concert, right? Yep. But one of the members, a woman, possibly your wife, forgot their phone on a little uh, the, drive, the, scooter the drive scooter that they're going out. She goes out to get it. When she's coming back in, another family will not let her in. And and, and so, and, and they're harassing her and, and stuff like that. And so once you come out, the bad news here is you wait for him and start jawing with them and tell them, hey, why didn't you let my wife in? And this ensues. A brawl okay, ensues. So there's, I see a family here that's all in all white with yes. like red shorts on. I was just at Disney. This is a very like common type of like family yeah. dress code. We did not do that. I found that was embarrassing. But <laughs> oh, you didn't do the whole people in black? fight in line. That's it. Seemed to me like the kind of outfit if you've got a group of a certain size, wear. you need sure. to have color coded things. You need to have Dude. color coded yeah. so you can find everybody. Yeah. Three misdemeanors banned from the park for forever, and somebody went to the hospital. There's one guy whose shirt says uh, "Namaste" yes. in bed. He probably should have, because he had a giant welt on his head, getting, <laughs> getting punched <laughs> by somebody. Here. The family they got banned. They asked if they could still go to Typhoon Lagoon, and unfortunately, um, no. Unfortunately, no, the mouse, no. the house of mouse, said, "No, you guys aren't going anywhere." Uh, that video went on for like another minute and a half, too. Oh, it's uh, people punching each other at Bill. Thank you for coming on the show. Find me Twitter at Timothy Dooner. Find him at Vincent that dude. Find uh, Bill online. Subscribe to the show. Don't be a stranger and tell me how to be. Hey, peace and love. Spread it everywhere.